Okay, hello everyone and thank you for joining us tonight for the second of our two-part webinar series with Morris Blackburn, Know Your Rights and Entitlements as a Bike Rider, Crashes Not Involving Motor Vehicles. My name is Anthea Hargreaves, I am Bicycle Network's General Manager of Public Affairs and Marketing and I will be your host for this evening. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we work and live and pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders past, present and emerging. We celebrate the diversity, stories and traditions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of Australia. As mentioned, tonight's webinar is brought to you by Bicycle Network and Morris Blackburn, where you will hear from Dimi Yuanu, our principal lawyer and practice group leader at Morris Blackburn Lawyers. Dimi is in charge of the firm's public and product liability team in Melbourne and is an accredited specialist in personal injury law. Welcome, Dimi. Thanks for that lovely introduction, Anthea. No worries. Well, Dimmy today will focus on the common risks facing people who ride, including tram tracks, bike paths, I think even potholes, construction zones. So bike rider crashes where no other vehicle is involved is more common than you think. It actually is the number one crash that is claimed through Bicycle Network's membership, as you're often not eligible for TAC coverage and many people find themselves out of pocket. But lucky for Bicycle Network members, we've got their back with medical income and third party coverage anytime you ride, anywhere in Australia, whether a vehicle has been involved or not. So this webinar tonight will be recorded and conclude with a Q&A. So please, I do encourage you to use that Q&A or chat function at the bottom of your Zoom screen to ask any burning questions. I will now hand over the reins to Dimmy from Morris Blackburn and please bear with us as we swap over those share screens. Okay, and share. Okay, we're right to go, Anthea? All good. Excellent. Okay. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction. And my name is Dimi Yuanu, and I do head the public and product liability team here in Victoria. And it's an honour to have this collaboration with Bicycle Network. We've been working with Bicycle Network and being in partnership with Bicycle Network for over 15 years. Um, and I've been involved the whole time, which is exciting because I've been with the firm. I've been at Morris Blackburn for over 18 years now. So um, it, it's nice to have this ongoing partnership with Bicycle Network um, and assisting the community and, and cyclists and everyone that um, needs assistance in this regard. But as Anthea mentioned earlier, um, cycling accidents don't only happen when with, with vehicles involved. They do happen with a lot of other public hazards, which I will be talking about today. Um, and on this presentation, I will be discussing your rights as a cyclist to pursue a public or a product liability claim. But please feel free to ask me any questions along the way. So in order, to, in order to commence or to start with a public liability claim, uh, we do have thresholds in Victoria. These thresholds were introduced back in 2003. So in order for a cyclist to make a claim for pain and suffering damages, you must show that you have suffered a permanent impairment of greater than 5% for a physical injury. And how that works is that we will, we, we'll send you off to an independent orthopaedic surgeon who is qualified in Victoria to assess your injuries under what we call the fourth edition American Medical Association guidelines. Unless you are assessed under these guidelines, you can't proceed with a claim. For a psychological injury, it's different. The threshold is is, is a lot higher, uh, it's 10% in order to be able to proceed with a public liability claim. Uh, so the threshold is different, but again, it's assessed under the fourth edition AMA guidelines. And all public liability claims are covered by the Wrongs Act in Victoria. However, if you do not meet the threshold, you do have other entitlements. And that is what, what we call out-of-pocket expenses. And in order for you to be able to proceed with an out-of-pocket expenses claim, you still need to show that there was a negligent third party. Uh, but things that you are covered for under an, an out-of-pocket expenses claim are things such as cost of your medical, rehabilitation and pharmaceutical expenses, your loss of earnings. Um, so it's important that you keep a record of the time that you have taken off work and and also the cost of replacing your bike, helmet, and any other accessories involved in the accident, but subject to establishing negligence against a third party. 
limitation. It's very important to know that in Victoria, any claim for compensation must commence within three years from the date of your injury. If you do not bring a claim within three years from the date of your injury, you'll be statute barred and you cannot proceed. However, for minors and people under a disability, they have six years from the date of injury to proceed with a claim. So the, the time limitation is a lot longer for minors and people with under a disability. Negligence, our favourite topic. So in order to bring a successful compensation claim, it is necessary to prove that your injury was caused by the negligence of another party. So if you are cycling down and you just happen to be, you just happen to fall over and there was no hazard in front of you, um, there is nothing we can do. We need to be able to establish that a third party was at fault. You need to be able to prove that the defendant is and was at all material times a road authority within the meaning of the Road Management Act. They are the predominantly most of our cases involved with the Road Management Act. However, I will speak about uh, other potential defendants in this presentation a bit later on. You also need to prove that the road authority owed you a duty to take reasonable care to avoid the risk of foreseeable injury. Now, I know that's a bit of legal jargon there, um, but we do need to show that they breach their duty of care to you. Okay, now um, this is something that you're probably all very, very familiar of, but as a lawyer, it is my job to just reinforce you and reinstate, uh, reinstate this, and I'm sure Anthea will be proud. But um, it, if for bike riders, it is really important to consider adequate insurance coverage. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. And also take responsibility for own safety as well as others on the road. Um, you know, there's a lot of, these days there's a lot of group riders um, and um, there's been a few collisions in relation to group riders. And the law is not really fixed on group riders and how it works, uh, but um, it's really important to make sure you are you do have a certain amount of distance between other riders when you are definitely riding in a group. And if you see a hazard, report it. Ensure compliance with Australian standards for manufacturing and supply of goods. For example, always ensure your actions do not pose a risk for yourself or, or for others. Now, I want to give you some examples of negligent cases that we have seen here at Morris Blackburn and some of the cases that our that the third parties have been at fault have and why we were able to proceed claims is for, is for these reasons that I'm about to um, speak to. So for example, there's been a failing to inspect, maintain and or remove overgrown bushes and trees. And later on, I'll show you a case and a photo where we represented a cyclist where there was overgrown bushes and trees, which, which, had, which later affected his ability from seeing oncoming traffic or other hazards. Failing to warn cyclists of dangerous dangers such as changed conditions, potholes, washed away sections. Um, at our last webinar, um, there was a there was a, a question asked about potholes, um, and you know, and that is an obvious hazard. Um, you know, councils are liable to maintain and inspect and ensure that and road authorities that um, these are our maintained and fixed when reported um, because you know um, you can't avoid a pothole failing to act on reports or complaints about hazards or the state of bike path um, and just on that uh, when we do have a claim the first thing we do is we um, we obtain a freedom of information from the relevant authorities and the reason why we do that is to check that previous complaints were made about that particular area where the cyclist had the accident. Um, and if there has been previous complaints and the relevant authority has failed to comply with the Australian standards and maintain and fix that area, then, that, then they are negligent. And the last point is that failing to give warnings that the bike path is either closed ahead due to dangerous conditions. And again, I have another case scenario where I do speak further about this. So this is a perfect example of insufficient warning. In this case, there was a road authority that knew about the damage culvert on track, but failed to undertake repairs and failed to warn users of the dangers ahead, which is which is as the cyclist was coming around this corner and collided. So in this case, our client was traveling along this track 
when he rounded the corner, he hit an exposed drainage pipe um, and loose gravel and suffered serious injuries as a result of that. He wasn't given sufficient warning prior to leading to the event of, of the drainage pipe and the loose gravel. And in that case, we were able to establish negligence and sue the relevant road authority. This is another uh, case where there's insufficient warning. Um, and just following on, this is the pipe that was exposed uh, where the cyclist collided. So I just thought I'd show an image of that um, because uh, I think photographs are really important in these cases and I'll explain why later. Warning hazards. Uh, so a couple of examples where work's been undertaken to resurface a section bike path, newly laid bitumen asphalt was oily, the track lines and green surface track were yet to be applied, no barricades were in place to stop cyclists from using path. Cyclists not warned about the slippery nature of the path and cyclists riding around a slight curve in the path on their bike and due to the oily surface, their bike slipped from underneath them. And we've seen a lot of case scenarios in relation to that. What to do if you're involved in an accident? As soon as possible after your accident, take good quality photographs because these are relied on in court. We use these photographs to show a judge or a jury where the accident occurred and the ins insufficient warning that our clients had to experience. Um, and that is one way we can establish negligence. So we, we, we show these photos in court and we, sh we show, uh, for example, that that ex unexposed pipe, um, that was an obvious hazard. Um, so it's really important to take photos immediately after the accident, take photos of any signage that was in the near surroundings of the where the accident occurred, take photos of any track surface, take photos of any obstruction to line of sight, and Moving forward after the photographs have taken and obviously the claimant or the cyclist have sought medical treatment because that's um, your number one priority is to, to get your health and to, and to recover from any injuries. Um, keep receipts of all your out-of-pocket expenses. So if you've gone to the doctors, if you've had to go to a private hospital, ensure that you keep copies of all receipts of your hospital visits, medication, uh, because that's something that we can put a claim forward and seek reimbursement in relation to your out-of-pocket expenses. It's also really crucial that you write down the names and addresses of all witnesses, because witnesses are very uh, heavily relied upon in these proceedings. Um, you know, if you've got a third independent witness backing your story and saying, yep, I saw that exposed pipe, or I saw that hazard, shouldn't have been there, um, that will support your claim moving forward. And it's always important that you record the exact date and time of the accident, because if you decide to bring a claim two years later, you might forget the exact date or the exact time the accident happened. Um, the one thing I tell all my clients in terms of any public liability claims is to always keep a diary. Keep a diary from the date from the accident happened um, and, and any events that occur for in terms of medical treatment, names of doctors, you had a pot expenses, just keep a diary of all of that because if you do decide to bring a claim later on down the track, it's all there because we all forget what we did a week ago, let alone a year ago. So uh, it's really important that we do uh, keep a track record of all the events and a chronology of our medical treatment and out-of-pocket expenses that we have incurred as a result of an accident. So the one thing that our defendant lawyers, uh, when we do proceed a claim, fight us on is, is what we call liability. Uh, and what happens is that when we file a statement of claim um, in relation to our, a cyclist accident, uh, the next step is for the def defendant lawyers to file a defense. And in most cases, I could honestly say in approximately 80% of cases, they deny liability. So it's our job to prove them wrong. Um, so the things we look out for is, is, is um, obstruction and line of sight. So for example, is oncoming traffic obscured for you? Um, that's one thing we look for. And if it is, then we're able to establish negligence, you know, by foliage or other objects adjacent to track, by blind spots along track or unexpected turns. 
Um, and in this particular case example, um, and all these photos that I'm showing you here today are cases that we have ran here at Morris Blackburn and finalised and settled for, for claimants. So in this particular image, our client collided with oncoming cyclists because of the layout of the bike path and the overgrown bushes and trees. So what we did in that case is that we um, filed a freedom of information with the council to see whether there had been previous complaints regarding the overgrown bushes um, and whether and, and to see what the council had done uh, with respect to those lodgement of complaints. Did they come and maintain and ins inspect that particular area? So failing to adequately inspect and maintain a particular road authority is negligent by any authority, by the by the by the council um, or by or by whether it's whether Vic Roads own that owns that road, um, but that's our job to identify the correct respondent and um, add them to the proceedings. Because the one thing you should be mindful of is that, um, you know, we, we sometimes have multiple defendants in an accident. So it could be Vic Roads, it could be the council, it could be a construction company. Um, you know, there's a lot of construction going on at the moment. And, you know, we've got another case at the moment, um, which I can talk a little bit about where a cyclist suffered an injury um, and we are suing both the council and the construction site because the construction site had left um, hazards there which contributed to the accident. So what we look for in determining liability is the hazard obvious. Does the surface of the bike path unexpectedly change? Has loose debris fallen onto path? Is the surface washed out? Are there potholes or raised service lids and grades? So that happens a lot where we do see potholes. Um, we get a lot of inquiries at Morris Blackburn where cyclists have collided because of a, pot, a, a pothole or loose debris fallen onto paths. Uh, so um, it's one thing to really notice. And if that happens to any of you, which I hope it doesn't, make sure you please take photos. What we look for in determining liability. Signage is really important and I've got, a, I've got another photo to show you all why. Um, distance from the hazard is also really important um, because if they don't give you enough warning um, of, of, of a distance from a hazard, then it's, the, the collision's unavoidable. Too close to hazard to allow sufficient time to avoid a hazard, too far away from a hazard. Do signs stand out? Are they visible? Are signs suited to the task? Detour signs, warning signs, shared paths. Signs at works lasting longer than two weeks should be erected in a permanent manner. And this is the perfect example. Our client in this case, and this was a case that we settled last year, our, clients, our client collided with this orange mesh over here. And this accident could have been avoided because this detour sign was on the floor, it was on the ground. So the cyclist couldn't even see it. And, and by the time he had gotten to the, to, and there wasn't enough warning in order for him to, to, uh, to see the mesh and collide with it. So um, as, in, as, as stated, the, det the detour sign was laying on the ground and, the time, and at the time of the accident and the collision was unavoidable. Um, so we were able to establish negligence in that case. As previously mentioned, there are a couple of authorities that can be sued in these court proceedings. If you see a hazard on a bike path, um, you need to notify the reasonable authority in writing, um, always, always in writing. Um, and, and a couple of the authorities that are potential defendants in these cases are the council, Vic Roads, state agencies such as Department of Environment and Primary Industries, Parks Victoria, but also, also lately we've been adding construction sites. Um, there's a lot of construction going on at the moment now, um, and they've also been potential defendants, but that's our job for to identify the, the appropriate respondent in these court proceedings. If the hazard is not made safe, then the fact that the authority knew of the hazard but did nothing may be relevant when making a public liability claim. And report to our friends at Bicycle Network, 
notices of hazard reports to bicycle networks can be placed on, on its website and in newsletters to members. Um, and I know I have these discussions with Craig all the time, the CEO at Bicycle Network. Um, whenever we see an obvious hazard, especially where we, we've, we've witnessed a cyclist, uh, a number of cyclists collide in the same area. And this is a real problem. Um, it, there was a, a specific area approximately three years ago where uh, three cyclists had a collision in the same area. So, you know, I got on the phone to Craig and said, look, this is an obvious hazard. We have reported it, but it's something for your members to be well aware of. And he was, uh, and he was right on it, like he always is. A case example, and I want to mention that this is a sad case example, uh, but it was a real life case example we had. And in this case, a lot of people are not aware that um, you can you can run a nervous shock claim if you've lost a nut, if you've lost a loved one because of a cycling accident. So in this case, the widow of a bike rider who died in 2010 while he was riding on the Coomba Park boardwalk in Vermont South. And some of you may already uh, be very familiar with this. Uh, the deceased rode off the edge of the boardwalk, striking his head on the log on the ground next to the boardwalk. He sustained fatal head injuries. An expert uh, was necessary for us to obtain. We always get expert reports uh, when we're running these court proceedings uh, to establish uh, liability, such as the failure of defendant to eliminate curves, the line of sight, width of the path, lack of delineation of the edges of the path, the lack of the barriers or the fencing along the path, and lack of training of rangers to assess risks posed by objects beside the path. So we, we obtained an expert in that case. The expert was very supportive of our client, his wife, who we pursued this claim for, um, and we ran a nervous shock claim for her as a result of, of, of the negligence of the third party. Uh, this was one of my cases um, where uh, the client was riding to work at dawn, and this happens quite frequently. Um, as he approached a bike path in a well-known public garden, he was able to detect two bollards because they had reflectors picked up by the light of his bike. However, there was a third bollard without a reflector in the middle of the two marked bollards. He rode into the unmarked bollard. Um, and and this, uh, we settled this claim because obviously he wasn't able to see the middle, the, the, the middle of the two marked bollards. Um, because they because they weren't lit up and um, he collided. So it, that was unforeseen. Um, uh, that was uh, negligence again, and we were able to settle this claim. But we also, Morris Blackburn received an inquiry just last week regarding bollards. So bollards is something, um, you know, that are coming up quite popular these days because a lot of riders are, you know, especially now with um, daylight saving ending and, uh, you know, it's dark already at 5.30, it's really important that they do, that, 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 it, that there are lighting on, on, the, on the bollards so people can see. Um, but uh, so one thing to, to keep a lookout for. Uh, so that's making a public liability claim. Uh, we, here at Morris Blackburn, we also see a lot of product liability claims where there's been a faulty product um, involved and you can sue the manufacturer as a result of a faulty product. So uh, if you've been injured by a faulty or unsafe product, you may be entitled to make a claim for compensation for your pain and suffering, your loss of enjoyment of life, your loss of earnings, um, and we also, and any medical treatment for past and future care. Uh, so all that is claimable. An engineer will need to provide an expert report uh, regarding the faulty product in every case. Um, to be able to produce to court to show that the product was unsafe and uh, we must also determine that the product was not fit for purpose. All product liability claims are made under the Competition and Consumer Act as well as the Wrongs Act, so we plead both. What we suggest you do, uh, go onto online forums and do research before purchasing any equipment. Keep records of all servicing done on your bike. Uh, if you make repairs yourself, um, and we've seen this before, ensure you follow the manufacturer's manual. 
and keep receipts for any equipment you purchase. Even if it's your bike helmet, keep a receipt for it. Um, if you have an accident, do not repair your bike, please, because the one thing we need is for an expert to inspect that bike to show that it was not fit for purpose. And if you've repaired it, um, there goes our evidence. So do not repair your bike after your accident um, if you're going to proceed with a civil claim. Keep any part of the bike that has been broken off, take photos of your bike and keep receipts of all your out-of-pocket expenses. Again, your hospital visits, your medication and so forth. What to look for. Make sure your tire thread is not worn. Uh, check brakes, light seat and other equipment before setting off. Go to a, rep a reputable repairer and check for loose baskets, reflectors or bag holders. And this, this is a case where we settled at Morris Blackburn. It was a very sad case. Um, the client suffered very serious injuries. And in this case, our client was riding uh, her bike when a bracket holding, which was this bracket um, holding the front basket, dislodged and wrapped around the front tire of her bike, throwing her over the handlebars. And she was actually coming down a hill and tumbled over. And she suffered very serious injuries. Um, so it's, and, and in that case, we obtained an expert report. He was able to say, he was able to say that the, that the um, basket was faulty and was unsafe. Um, and we were able to successfully sue the manufacturer in that case. And that comes to the end of my presentation um, regarding public and product liabilities. And I'd love um, to hear any questions. Thanks so much, Jimmy. That was so insightful, very clear, lots of helpful detail. I'm sure a lot of people got a lot of out, out of it. I did just want to reiterate some important information. And I think that it was a common theme throughout what you said, which was take photos. If you've been in a crash, doesn't matter what the crash, whether it's motor vehicles or not, um, a damaged product, take photos, record as much as you can, get that witness statements and contact details. And I think that hot tip about keeping a diary so that you're keeping track of every kind of interaction you're having with doctors, receipts, all of that, all just helps you, I guess, make sure that that claim is successful um, and helps lawyers and bicycle network do what we do best and make sure that your rights are looked after. Um, before That's we correct, do get, Anthea. <laughs> yes, <laughs> take we, photos, take lots of photos. Yeah, it was definitely something that, I, that came through very strongly. <laughs> yeah. um, before I do get started, I did just want to reiterate that, you know, Bicycle Network does have your back every time you ride with support from Morris Blackburn, along with our comprehensive bike riding insurance, which does include medical coverage. So that is like where we'll cover things that others don't. So dental, orthodontic, physiotherapy, and even acupuncture, as long as you provide a reference from a qualified medical practitioner. Um, we also look at income protection. So if you're injured on your bike or can't work after a crash, we'll pay up to 85% of your weekly earnings for 52 weeks. And then lastly, that third party coverage. So for any damage to another person's property or injury causing them, you'll just need to pay the first $1,000 and we'll take it from there. And then, you know, that's where Morris Blackburn come in under our riders' rights. We'll help you get that, make that claim, give you all the advice you need so that you can ride rest assured that we've got your back no matter where you ride anywhere in Australia um that's correct Anthea sorry <laughs> I was just going to add that's correct Anthea and we offer free consultation so even if you don't want to proceed uh we, we, with Morris Blackburn um or proceed with a claim um we offer this free service because we are partnered with Bicycle Network so uh, it's, we're just a phone call away and we can give you some free advice over the phone it's great. It's, it's exactly that kind of peace of mind that people want when they're out riding their bikes. Um, we did have a couple of questions come through. We'll do our Excellent. best to answer them and anything we can't answer, we'll take on notice and pop them up on our website when we do share this webinar recording tomorrow. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a name for the first question that came through. I have 61407. Um, so they have a video of a crash running into a horizontal bar. Um, which was put there by council. Note that there were no markings and I rode into it at about 20 kilometres per hour. Um, I do hope you're okay, just as I continue. Yes. To go, um, and council cannot be charged because supposedly the council is exempt. And I mean, that's a very specific question and seems yeah. like it needs a little bit more detail. Yeah. Um, and it, it seems like you did cover a little bit whether or not, you know, establishing that negligence. And I, I know you touched on that. 
I did, yes. And I can't see why, did they say why the council is exempt? Um, they might not be the relevant authority to sue. Uh, it could be owned by Vic Rhodes or another relevant authority, um, but, but we can definitely look into that and see who the appropriate authority is. And also in addition, uh, the one thing we do straight away is we do a freedom of information to see if previous complaints were, were made in relation to that bar. And if they have failed to come and fix that, um, then we will be able to establish negligence against the third party. So yeah, in that case, it's probably best to either reach out to Bicycle Network or Morris Blackburn and we'll set you on a path and sort of collect the details and see what we can do for you there as a member of ours. Um, the other question that we got was from Cara. So is there an SLA or a service level agreement for councils to repair such things as potholes post the time of the issue being raised? Uh, yes, they have a responsibility to maintain and inspect road authorities um, and any um, any, if especially if a complaint has been made to them and lodged with them, they have a responsibility to come out and um, and um, fix that hazard. Yeah, that's great. Hopefully that answers your question, Cara. Um, last chance for any other questions. It doesn't seem we've had any come through. Um, all clear, I'm giving any time. I guess from there, I will say thank you. And thank you, Dimi, so much for your time today and all the information. Oh, a question has just popped through from yes, John. It John, has. you've just snuck in. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um, if I see a pothole on a road, how do I determine who to report it to, Vic Roads or local councils? Yeah, good question. Really um, good question. You, um, a very good question. Um, and the answer is you may have to report it to both, but I would definitely start off with the council first. And they'll be they'll be quick to say if they're not the relevant authority, and if they're not, then um, report it to Vic Roads. Right, look, I've got a couple more. That last one. Oh, that's great. Get a lot of, keep through. them coming. Um, so Eve Stocker from Rindry Country Cool and Nation Land. If a rider has a pre-existing health condition, does it make it not possible to make a claim? Example, if a person suffers a fracture and they have osteoporosis. Good question. Um, and the reason I say that is because a lot of our clients have pre-existing injuries. And what that happens is that as long as you're up front and you let us know what it is, um, we will then tell the doctor who assesses you that you have this pre-existing injury. And if he's still able to assess you and you are able to meet the threshold of greater than 5% for a physical injury, um, then you could still proceed with a claim. Um, what may happen in some cases is that, you know, if your claim is worth X amount of dollars and you have suffered the same injury and you've just exacerbated that particular injury, like let's just call it a back injury, and you've, you had a previous back injury and you exacerbated that back injury because of this cycling accident, um, the defendant lawyers may argue, well, we're going to reduce the damages because your client had pre-existing, but you can still proceed with a claim even if you have pre-existing injuries. Right, and then one more question we've got from M. Lorenzo. What happens if you have an accident and can't take photos at the moment and by the time you go back to the accident mm. site, they raise a sign that was fallen or change the signage in the meantime? Yeah, look, it does make it a bit more difficult for us in order to be able to say that so, because it, it becomes your word against theirs. Um, but I, but don't let that discourage you. Still come and speak to a lawyer, Morris Blackburn, about it and we'll just see if what we can do. Our job is to investigate these kind of claims and if we can help, we will. Yeah, and I mean, you know, often when you have a crash, you first, as I think, Demi, you raise as well, it's making sure that you're okay, making sure Definitely. that you're being looked after. Um, so it is difficult, but if we keep reiterating that kind of, you know, it is kind of even destabilising. It's hard to remember all of this stuff, but that's where witnesses are really helpful as well. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, collecting information like that. Definitely. Um, you know, you, your health is your number one priority. So obviously getting to a hospital to a doctor is, is the first thing that comes to anybody's mind. And I know that you could potentially forget to take photos in that, you know, because you, you're a bit traumatised and shocked at that particular time point in time um, but you know maybe you know we keep spreading the word and the messaging is that maybe you can then ask a family member to then go back um, and and take photos of the accident but we've had a lot of cases where um, you know there's, there've been hazards involved and then the council's gone and fixed it the next day but we still proceed with these claims because it's your instructions and if that's what's happened that's what's happened to you so um, it's your journey it's your it's your story and we still proceed those types of claims so yeah it doesn't discourage me. Great. All right, that seems to be the last of our questions. Um, I prematurely jumped to it, so I do apologise for those people, but I'm glad we got them across the line. <laughs> Um, so thank you so much, Jimmy. So that does wrap up our webinar in partnership with Bicycle Network membership and Morris Blackburn. Know your rights and entitlements as a bike rider. Crashes not involving motor vehicles for this evening. 
Um, a bicycle network membership is so much more than just bike riding insurance. And I really hope that comes across today. So whether you have a crash or feel that you've been wronged in any way, whether that's on the road, on a path, um, our legal support with Morris Blackburn means we've got your back every time you ride. So whether you have a crash, an altercation on the road, or just need understanding or some help understanding your rights, Bicycle Network is your first point of contact. Please don't be afraid to give us a call or get in touch via our website. And if you are in need of legal support, our partner law firm, Morris Blackburn, will provide a consultation at no charge, which is what Dimmy raised before. So for $11.49 a month, you can rest assured that Bicycle Network will have your back every time you ride anywhere in Australia. Thank you again, Dimmy and Morris Blackburn. That does bring up the end to our two-part webinar series. We did have one earlier, which is now available on our website for you to tune in and this will also be available on our website so thank you everyone for joining um, and we'll see you next time thanks, thank Jimmy. you everyone thanks Anthea hope you enjoyed it thank you